Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome back to Guys and Magic. This is Hunter and Steven. Say what up, Steven. Hey, what's up, guys? We are back. That is right. Welcome to the Bloomboro Upgrades. We are doing the $100 upgrade to Family Matters. That is right, Steven. You had the opportunity to go ahead and upgrade this deck as well as the backup. If you guys wanted to see the backup commander and all the upgrades from Arthur, check the description for our Patreon link. It's over there. But this is the face commander. It is Zinnia. So, Steven, go ahead and talk to me about the face commander and kind of what the deck wants to do. Yeah, so the face commander is Zinnia Valley's Voice. It is a blue, red, and a white for a 1-3 legendary creature, Bird Bard. It has flying, and then it also gets plus X plus 0, or X is the number of other creatures you control with base power 1. It also has a really fun ability that I really love. Creature spells you cast have offspring 2. If you don't remember what Offspring does, I'll let you know. So you may pay an additional two mana as you cast a creature spell. If you do, when that creature enters, create a 1-1 one, one token copy of it. So this deck wants to go wide and it cares a lot about ETBs. Really loves those enter the battlefield triggers and it is chock full of them, I'll tell you what. That sounds awesome, man. Uh, it sounds like uh, you're going to be getting quite a bit of damage too with Zinnia. Yeah, so Xenia having that evasion with flying is going to be super strong, and all of the creatures in this deck, that ETB and that make 1-1s, one it's going to get out of hand pretty pretty quick. All right, man. Well, I'm excited to see what you've thrown into this deck to make it even scarier. Go ahead and talk to me. It looks like we're talking creatures first. What do we got? Yeah, we are going to talk creatures first. I'm going to go ahead and start off with these three, so let's go ahead and rattle them off with Anim Pakal, Thousandth Moon. It is one, a red and a white for a 1-2 legendary creature human soldier. And then whenever you attack with one or more non-gnome creatures, put a plus one, plus one counter on an call. Then create X-1-1 one, one colorless gnome artifact creature tokens that are tapped and attacking, where X is the number of plus one, plus one counters on an call. Obviously, we want to make a bunch of 1-1s, one and we really love the fact that an call can make a lot of them for us. This is one of my favorite cards. I've seen you play it, Hunter, and it's very aggressive, and it gets out of hand. Oh, yeah. And since it's on attacks, you're going to be making a bunch of 1-1s one if you're already swinging it with Zinnia. It just, uh, Zinnia's power gets bumped up immediately. That's awesome. Mm-hmm, exactly. Next up, we have Kaith Fame Mechanist. This is one, a blue, a red, and a white for a 3-3 legendary creature dwarf artificer. It's got Fabricate 1. If you don't remember what Fabricate is, this is going to be a pretty strong ability here for our deck. Whenever this creature enters the battlefield, put a plus 1, plus 1 counter on it, or create a 1-1 one, one colorless servo artifact creature token. It also says other non-token creatures you control have Fabricate 1. You can pay 2, tap it, choose 1, populate, or proliferate. Uh, proliferate we don't really care about but populating it's going to be pretty cool here plus the fabricate ability is going to be insane in this deck yeah you can populate any of the offspring cards that you made that's <laughs> that sounds mm -hmm. like a lot of fun yeah getting those extra etbs is going to be super strong and also just us being able to cast our creatures and then getting that fabricate one and making another one one it's it's pretty strong especially mm -hmm. when you think about making the offspring tokens as well yeah, I can I can see that already. But I know what you're saying. What are you going to do with all these low power creatures? Well, we're going to try and draw some cards. So Welcoming Vampire got added to the deck. This is two and a white for a 2-3 creature vampire with flying. It also says whenever one or more other creatures with power two or less enter the battlefield under your control, draw a card. This ability only triggers once each turn. Granted, I do know that that kind of sucks, the once each turn clause. But we do have some fun mechanics in this deck to possibly populate. Hashtag Kaith, or mm -hmm. some other spells in the deck that could get us that trigger multiple turns. Yeah, I could definitely see that. That's uh, man, these three cards they go really well in this deck so far. I'm, I'm already liking mm -hmm. what I see. But uh, looks like we got a couple gods that are making their way into the deck as well. Yeah, Hunter, you added two gods. Funny enough, I added two gods as well. So first one up is going to be Perforos, God of the Forge. This is three and a red for a 6-5 legendary enchantment creature god with indestructible. And then as long as your devotion to red is less than five, Perforos isn't a creature. And then whenever another creature enters the battlefield under your control, Perforos deals two damage to each opponent. It's got another fun ability where you can pay two and a red. Creatures you control get plus one, plus zero until end of turn. Uh, obviously we don't care about that whatsoever. Uh, we really care about the two damage to each opponent. We are making a ton of tokens and this is going to get hurtful very quickly. Yeah, this is a go wide strategy, kind of all-star. Perforos is going to deal a ton of damage. I'm terrified. 
Mm -hmm. And of course, we are playing a ETB style deck. Uh, so you can't have that without a little fun. So we added Thassa Deep Dwelling. This is three and a blue for a 6-5 legendary enchantment creature god with indestructible as well. This one cares about your devotion to blue. If it's less than five, Thassa isn't a creature. And at the beginning of your end step, exile up to one other target creature you control, then return that card to the battlefield under your control. It also has a fun ability where you can pay three, a blue, and tap another target creature. Again, kind of costly on that side, but we really only care about that blinking effect. Uh, Thassa works very well in this deck, and it's super, super strong. Yeah, I can see why these two are added here. Both good cards. Yep. Moving on to the non-creature department, we got a couple of sorceries. What are these ones? Yeah, so we'll talk about these three here. So first one up is Song of Totentons. It is X and a red. It says, create X 1-1 one, one black rat creature tokens with this creature can't block. Creatures you control gain haste until end of turn. So if we have Perforos on the field or even our commander, we can literally just make a ton of 1-1s, one, pump our commander, do a bunch of pinging damage with Perforos. Mm -hmm. And then just hurt somebody for a lot with those rats because they'll have haste. Yes, yes, you will. That is uh that's a that's gonna be deadly. And if you had just one red mana after you made a whole bunch of stuff and you had lethal on board, just make everything haste anyways, without the rats. I'm um, exactly. Yep, you don't have to pay anything into that X cost, you can just pay one red mana to give everything on your side of the board haste. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this deck is really fun because it does deal with board wipes very well. Uh, you can rebuild very strongly after a board wipe, and I think that's why I really do enjoy this deck. But speaking of building after a board wipe, I did add White Sun's Twilight. This is X and two white. You gain X life, create X 1-1 one, one colorless Phyrexian might artifact creature tokens with Toxic 1, and this creature can't block. If X is five or more, destroy all other creatures. Uh, I love this card. Yeah. Fantastic. This is an all-star. I run a token deck myself, and this is one of the board wipes I run because it's just that good. Yep. Uh, this is not only a board wipe, this is a good source of life gain as well. And then also it rebuilds a good board state for you. And, you also, know? and also surprise poison. Yeah, surprise. <laughs> you're going to get poisoned. Uh, yeah, surprise. We do have a toxic uh, poison deck uh, in a Jeskai deck, which is funny. Uh, but yeah, the last sorcery I added here is going to be Farewell. This is four and two white. It has a lot of abilities, and you can choose one or more. You, you can exile all artifacts, creatures, enchantments, or graveyards. Uh, super strong. I love Farewell. I don't really play it in a lot of my decks, but this is super strong. And after seeing a lot of the stuff that goes on in hashtag your deck hunter or everyone else's, I think having an ability to exile stuff is going to be really strong here. Yeah. Um, that's going to suck. Please don't play this when I have all of my cool artifacts and enchantments on the field. I just want to let you know that's exactly how I feel, and I say that in my head every time I play against you and you're playing a white deck. That's fair. Let's move on to the instance. I'm seeing one singular instant here, which is yep. a good card. Yep, we only really needed one singular instant to hurt someone. Uh, so Chroma's Will, obviously we are going super wide in this deck. Uh, this is three and a white. You can choose one. Or if you control a commander as you cast a spell, you may choose both. Uh, first mode here says creatures you control gain flying, vigilance, and double strike until in a turn. And the second mode says creatures you control gain lifelink, indestructible, and protection from each color until in a turn. So some versatility here. We can use this to basically either protect our board or we can end someone's life very quickly. Uh, Chroma's Will has ended a lot of games and I wanted it to end this one. That, that it has. That it has. All right. Uh, a Chroma's Will is terrifying, but let's go ahead and move on to, looks like, a couple of artifacts. What do we got? Yep, so let's move on to something that's been reprinted into the ground and made it super affordable for this deck. Panharmonicon, it is four mana for an artifact. It says, if an artifact or creature entering the battlefield causes a triggered ability of a permanent you control to trigger, that ability triggers an additional time. So really trying to work on the ETB effects for our cards. It's going to be super fun getting them twice, three times, four times? All the times. 
And then lastly, uh, I did add Sword of Hearth and Home. I do love all the swords, but this one works very well in this deck. This is three mana for an artifact equipment. Equipped creature gets plus two, plus two, and has protection from green and from white, so you can't swords me, and you can't do the other one. And then whenever an equipped creature deals combat damage to a player, exile up to one target creature you own. Then search your library for a basic land card, put both cards onto the battlefield under your control, then shuffle equipped two. So let's blink, let's get some lands, let's have a good time. Blink, lands, have a good time. Seems like you will be definitely having a good time so far with all these additions that I've seen. But let's move on. I see some real spicy enchantments here. Yeah, so the enchantment package in this deck was super, super good. Uh, I did want to spice it up just a little bit. So I did add a card that is kind of near and dear to me. It, I found it in, when I first started playing Magic, and it's uh, Determined Iteration. This is one in a red. It says, at the beginning of combat on your turn, populate. The token created this way gains haste, sacrifice it at the beginning of the next end step. Just being able to populate, get an additional trigger only for two mana is insanely strong. Uh, especially getting those ETB effects, it'll be really, really fun. Plus, it'll help buff our commander just one more. Just one more. But that might be all it takes. Next up, we have Intangible Virtue. This is one in a white. Pretty simple here. Creature tokens you control get plus one, plus one, and have vigilance. Uh, what's better than full swinging at somebody? being able to block right after. <laughs> That's for sure. Speaking of swinging, Roar of Resistance was added. This is one in a red. Creature tokens you control have haste, and then whenever one or more creatures attack, you may pay one in a red. If you do creatures attacking your opponents and or planeswalkers they control, get plus two, plus zero until end of turn. Lot of versatility here. This card's really fun. So not only does it give everything that we play that's a token, haste, but let's say it's not my turn and I want to try and bargain with another opponent saying, hey, if you don't swing at me, you swing at somebody else, I'll give all your creatures plus two plus zero. How does that sound? It's quite the bargain. Quite the bargain. Lastly, we have War Leader's Call. This is one, a red and a white. Creatures you control get plus one plus one. And then whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control, War Leader's Call deals one damage to each opponent. Obviously, we have Perforos in the deck. There's a couple other pingers, but having an enchantment. It's going to be a little fun, a little harder to get rid of. And this one's really fun. Yeah, I love all these pump effects you're throwing in here um, because your commander cares about the base power. So it doesn't matter how big they get. As long as that base power is still just a one, you are chilling. Yep, so. that's a very good point, Hunter. Thank you for bringing that up. As long as the base power of the cards you're making are one, which your commander will make when they make those offsprings, it's going to get out of hand. Definitely. War Leader's Call is one of my favorite enchantments in the game. I'm glad to see it at home here. And finally, it looks like you touched on the land department just a little bit. What do we got? Yep, so I'll go ahead and talk about these two lands first. I did add Deserted Beach and Storm Carved Coast. These lands both enter the battlefield tapped unless you control two or more other lands. Uh, Deserted Beach does tap for a white or a blue, and then Storm Carved Coast does tap for a blue or a red. Next up, let's talk about these two fun lands with fun abilities. We have Minas Tirith here. This is a legendary land, which is always fun, and it does enter the battlefield tapped unless you control a legendary creature. You can tap it to add a white, or you can pay one and a white, tap it, draw a card, activate only if you attacked with two or more creatures this turn. Funny enough, this deck is very combat heavy, and we're more than likely going to be swinging in with two or more. Uh, so to be able to basically, after combat, try and draw a card if we're trying to get some extra cards in hand it's going to be a good time be aggressive be be, be aggressive be aggressive <laughs> and the last land i'm adding here is going to be otawara soaring city legendary land as well it taps for a blue or it does have a fun channel ability which is very hard to stop and i do mean Pretty much impossible. Uh, so we do have three in a blue here. You can discard Odawara Soaring City, return target artifact, creature, enchantment, or planeswalker to its owner's hand. This ability costs one less to activate for each legendary creature you control. Uh, so being able to bounce something that might be coming at you or just having a fun land in hand, definitely very versatile, definitely very fun. Yeah, the flexibility there is too good to pass up. Bounce it out of the way. But is that it? Is that all of your additions? Those are all the additions, Hunter. Okay, well, you know what time it is. It's time to make room for those additions. So without any further ado, Stephen, go ahead and talk to me about all the cuts you're making from Family Matters. 
Yeah, so before we get into the cuts, I do want to make a disclaimer. Obviously, I built this deck a certain way. You guys are more than welcome to build your deck in whichever way you find fit. Uh, I will say uh, for most of the decks I build, I usually like to go on a low mana curve. Uh, I usually find that's best for me in my play style. Uh, with that being said, I did pretty much get rid of a lot of the heavy hitters in the deck. Uh, their ETBs weren't super strong. Uh, and if they were, it just was a little too expensive still. Uh, but first one up, I do hate to do it, but I normally do always cut the backup commander in all of my decks. Uh, just because I feel since we are building a 100 and a 300 on the face and the backup, I just kind of want to play around a little bit more with just the main ones of the deck at the time. So Arthur Marigold Knight is first up on the chopping block. This is two, a blue, a red, and a white for a four or five legendary creature mouse knight. It has haste, and then whenever it attacks with at least one other creature, you can look at the top six cards of your library. You may put a creature card from among them onto the battlefield tapped and attacking. Put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. Return that creature to its owner's hand at the end of combat. This is a really fun card. I would keep this in the deck because it does kind of help out a little bit. But at the same time, like I said, I kind of want to concentrate on just the main commander and having that base power one and all those ETBs. Yeah, yeah, I can see why it's being cut here. You really want to focus on what your base commander wants to do. And Arthur, while it's a very awesome card, uh, just uh, I see why you're cutting it. Yep. Angel of Ruins is up next. This is five and two white for a total of seven mana. It's a five, seven artifact creature angel. It's got flying. And then whenever it enters the battlefield, exile up to two target artifacts and or enchantments. It also has plane cycling too. Uh, good card, good effect. Uh, obviously, if we're able to play this and have the extra two mana for nine mana total and get rid of four uh, artifacts and or enchantments, I understand why it's in the deck. But when we have a lot of board wipes and spot removal, I didn't really find a point in having a seven mana card uh, in this deck. Uh, yeah. Next up is Hanged Executioner. This is two and a white for a 1-1 one, one creature spirit. It's got flying. Whenever it enters the battlefield, create a 1-1 one, one white spirit creature token with flying. You can also pay three and a white, exile it, and exile a target creature. Uh, the four mana to exile it and then exile target creature was a little aggressive for me. Uh, it's a pretty mana-intensive sink to try and do all that while playing this. Uh, I do like the fact that it makes a 1-1. One, one. It does buff our commander, and then with some of the ETB effects and the cards I added, it would be nice, but I just didn't really find a use for this card. Illusionary Ambusher is up next. This is 4 and a blue for a 4-1. It's got Flash, and then whenever it's dealt damage, you can draw that many cards. I understand why that's in the deck. Uh, I just don't really want to play a 5-mana Flash spell and hold up 5 blue mana just to hopefully when somebody swings at me, I say, gotcha! Uh, there's tons of card draw in this deck already, and I just don't really think that I need to spend five mana to do that. No gotchas here. No gotchas here. Uh, Inferno Titan is next on the chopping block. This is four and two red for a six six creature giant. You can pay a red, and then it gets plus one plus zero until end of turn for each red you sink into it. And then whenever ETBs or attacks, it deals three damage divided as you choose among one, two, or three targets. I just don't like it. I, I've never, I, even like back in the day when this card was first printed, I never really enjoyed Inferno Titan, but it's gone. And the last creature I'm removing is Gisal Goldmane. This is two and two white for a 4-4 legendary creature Cat Warrior. It's got first strike, and then you can pay three and two white. Attacking creatures you control get plus X plus X until end of turn, where X is the number of attacking creatures. Obviously, I know we are doing a go wide strategy, but for nine mana, uh, again, that is a ton of mana to sink into. And most of the time you're playing this, you're probably gonna have to wait a turn. It's probably gonna eat up removal. I just didn't find a point in having this. Yeah, I can see why all of these creatures didn't make the list in the final cut. Uh, they're just a bit too heavy and they don't do what you wanna do. It's as simple as that. But let's go ahead and move on to some sorceries. I know you added two brand new board wipes. I am seeing a couple of different Possible board wipes. Yep, so I did get rid of two board wipes. Obviously, I didn't want to have like six board wipes in the deck because I didn't want to play a six-hour game. <laughs> so I did I did remove two of them. Uh, Dusk is the first one up. Well, I should say Dusk to Dawn. Uh, Dusk is two and two white for a destroy all creatures with power three or greater. Dawn is three and two white. It's got Aftermath, so you are casting this from your graveyard. Uh, you return all creature cards with power two or less from your graveyard to your hand. Uh, could be good, 
could be really bad. Obviously, we do have a lot of pump effects in this deck. Uh, so basically, possibly wiping out our board didn't really strike me as well. Uh, I usually use a board wipe in a worst case scenario when I don't have a lot of stuff on my side of the field. So I just chuck this one into the bin. Uh, time wipe, two, two white, and a blue. Return a creature you control to its owner's hand, then destroy all creatures. Uh, it's an interesting board wipe. I like how you can save one thing. Uh, just never really enjoyed time wipe. Yeah, I've never enjoyed time wipe either. It's like, if I'm going to destroy everything, I'm going to destroy everything, and I'm going to do it for cheap. So, it's, uh, these two are very easily replaceable with the ones you made in the deck. Farewell, mm -hmm. especially, is going to do so much work with an exile effect. Exactly. But, uh, yeah. How about a couple instants? Yeah, I did get rid of two card draw spells, which I know we always say card draw wins games. I just have never really enjoyed at least one of them. So that first one is going to be Pool from Tomorrow. It is X into blue. You draw X cards and the discard a card. Pool from Tomorrow is a very interesting card. I do like its kind of effect, but again, you're just holding up mana. Usually, you don't ever want to play this on your main phase. You kind of want to see what you can do, hold up that mana, and then possibly play it on somebody's end step. And I just... I don't know. I, I just, I've never really enjoyed it. And then Rowdy Research, again, kind of don't enjoy it. It's six and a blue. Granted, this spell is kind of interesting in this deck just because it is pretty helpful. It does cost one less to cast for each creature that attacked this turn. You draw three cards, so it could cost one blue. Uh, but like I said earlier in the video, this deck does come with a lot of stock card draw already. So I didn't really feel like these two were necessary. Yeah, I totally see it. Uh, card draw does win games. However, this card draw does not. No, not in my deck. And finally, I see one singular enchantment that you are taking out. What is this little guy? This little guy is Echoing Assault, but it does not have a little guy cost. This is four and a red. Creature tokens you control have menace, and then whenever you attack a player, choose target non-token creature that's attacking that player. Create a token that's a copy of that creature, except it's a 1-1. One, one. The token enters tapped and attacking that player, sacrifice it at the beginning of the next end step. I like it because it gives your creature tokens menace. But when I have determined iteration in the deck for two, I think that's a lot stronger. Um, this at five mana seems a little aggressive. And I just think that, and you know, I've said it in a lot of videos, and Hunter, I started hearing you saying it, which is really fun. For five mana, I'd rather really do anything else. This card's interesting, because based on what we know about the offspring mechanic, this is basically offspring for creatures that attack. Um, and then you have to kill your children at the end step. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't get blocked, it's just the one way. Uh, sad. But yeah, I can see why this is being removed. Yeah, I mean, it's basically there for an ETB on one of those token copies, but, you know, it's just again, this deck does a really good job of doing it already, so I for five mana, I just didn't really care. Essentially, this card read five mana creature tokens you control have menace. Understandable. And finally, we did see you touch up the land base a little bit, but we are removing quite a bit more. What are we removing? Yeah, so if you know me and you've watched our videos for a while, you know I will cut lands more than anyone. Um, depending on the deck, I, in my opinion, I think that 34 lands is enough, especially with a ton of rocks, a ton of other ramp. Uh, I don't really feel like you need more than 34, depending on the deck. Now, obviously landfall, you want more and like heavy, heavy CMC creatures, you want more. Uh, but this deck, I trimmed down to 34 with the additions and removal. So I will go ahead and get into those now. Uh, I hate pain lands. Uh, I hate them with a fiery passion. So the first three cards I'm going to talk about are going to be Atacar Waste, Battlefield Forge, and Shivan Reef. Uh, these all tap for their respective colors, and they all ping you for one. Uh, I know in Magic, life is a resource, but my life is very important to me, and I want to keep it as high as possible. So they're gone. Path of Ancestry I got rid of next. It does enter the battlefield tapped, which is never fun. But also, our commander's a bird bard, and there's not a lot of birds in this deck. So I didn't really find an understanding of why Path of Ancestry is in the deck. I know it's Commander and it's a precon, so it's usually always in every precon, no matter what. But this one made absolutely no sense. It happens. It does happen. 
Uh, next up, I did get rid of one temple uh, just because I didn't want to keep the other ones. This deck is primarily like, you know, white and blue. There's not too much red in this deck. So I did get rid of some of the red cards. Uh, so Temple of Epiphany, it does enter the battlefield tapped. Uh, you do scry one when it enters, and then it does tap for a blue and a red. And then the last three cards I always get rid of in any deck that I see them in because it is confusing as hell to remember what you chose. Uh, and what I mean by that, I did get rid of Thriving Heath, Thriving Isle, and Thriving Bluff. They all enter the battlefield tapped, and when they enter, you get to choose a color other than whatever it is. So Thriving Heat says when it enters, choose a color other than white. It can tap for a white or the mana of the chosen color. Same thing for Thriving Isle except blue, and same thing for Thriving Bluff except red. Uh, again, I'm just a lazy magic player to a certain extent, and I just I don't really want to keep track of that. That's fair. Yeah. Is that going to do it? Is that all of the cuts and additions to the $100 upgrade to Family Matters? Yes, Hunter, those are all the additions. Okay, that's awesome. Well, the question now stands. You had $100 to go ahead and do all of these upgrades. What was the total after all of them? Well, Hunter, you know me. I just said I'm a lazy magic player, and I'm a big, fat, poopy cheater. Uh, so I did spend a little bit extra, but only by $0.08. Cents. This deck was $100.08 after uh, building it at the time of recording. Okay, fine. You almost hit a hundred on the nose, but I'll give you yes. eight cents. <laughs> All right, Stephen, do you have any final thoughts about Family Matters as a whole with Zinnia at the helm? Uh, it's a really fun deck. I mean, to be honest with you, if you love go wide strategies, uh, this deck is pretty fun out of the box already. Um, I think just adding a few cards, you can have an even better time. I don't really think you need to add too much to this deck. Uh, there's tons of ways you can play this deck too. There's so many more blink effects that you can add into here. Um, obviously, you know, when we build these decks, we don't want to go too hard in the cuts and the additions. Uh, we all have like different numbers. We like to stick around for cuts and additions, but you could really build this deck insanely blink heavy. And I think that's kind of the direction you kind of want to go. Uh, but you'd be chomping the deck hard. I'm not going to lie to you. Uh, you'd really have to get rid of a lot to make that kind of fun. Uh, other than that, I think it's really fun. Also, it, I think it's one of the first pre-cons in a while I've seen come with a infinite damage combo built into the deck. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's got a combat celebrant, and then also you have Helm of the Host. Uh, so if you have those two on the field, infinite combats. Perfect. That's just what we needed. <laughs> yeah, I didn't even have to put it in. All right. Well... If you guys wanted to see Steven's full list of Azinia, check the description for the Moxfield link. Playtest it yourself. Also in the description, you will find links to all of our social media accounts. That's TikTok. That's Twitter. That's Instagram. At guys at magic for each one. Follow us on those as well. Comment down below. Did you guys agree with all these upgrades? Maybe you disagreed. Always interested to hear guys' opinions. On the screen right now, those are all of our Patreon subscribers. That is right. Thank you guys so much for your added support. If you wanted to see what they are seeing, which is not here on YouTube, including the backup to this deck. That's right. Steven upgraded the backup to Family Matters as well. On top of all of the other backups to the other decks, check the link for our Patreon in the description below and consider subscribing. And until the next video, hope you guys have a great rest of your day. Peace. Bye, guys.